Hello, this is Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson. Uh, well, this is being recorded on the 20th of April, 2024, and we are in the midst of Lent. And because this is Lent, I ask for assistance from my readers and listeners. I know that for so many of you, you can't do what I do for a whole bunch of reasons. You can't be active. You can't you have so much right, you know, you can't afford to lose a job or to be murdered or, you know, because that could happen without a problem. You don't want to spend the rest of your life in court or, or, or whatever. And to a certain extent, of course, that's acceptable, especially when you have little kids. Um, but the one thing you can do is support people who are doing it. And these days... Uh, after 30 years of this, I've been doing this since there's been an internet. I've um, established myself. And, and, and establishing myself really has a lot to do with you keeping me functional and keeping me on the air. Um, so I don't remember if where I was. I don't know if I was reading something or if I was on a website. But some of you know... Back in 2018, maybe 2019, if you go back to my archives, you'll see that I did something on the Kabbalistic idea of Adam Kadman as the manifestation of Antichrist. To the extent, I mean, Adam Kadman, of course, is not a literal person, but it is the new man that, in fact... Um, may be the way that Antichrist presents himself. I just don't think it's going to be that obvious, <clears throat> as the Protestants seem to think. And because I read Kabbalah, you know, from Zohar, etc., which is not easy. There's a lot of simplifications of it out there. Um, it is, it is, you know, the dominant intellectual uh, Jewish way of viewing the world. It's not a fringe by any means. It's taken over Hollywood and all that. But as far as the identity of what Antichrist actually is, and the concept of Adam Cadman, of course, it's depi he's depicted as a person, um, is the new man, is the, is the primal man, as well as the man that Jewish control will create. It's Antichrist in all but personality. So I'm reading something, and I come across an ad. It may have been YouTube, come to think of it. And it said, Antichrist is here. Come listen to me. I'll tell you all about Adam Catman. And my stomach sank. There is exactly one place on this planet that anyone talking like me is going to get the idea of Adam Catman from. And that's me. I don't remember. I, I couldn't look at it. I couldn't look at it anymore. I just saw it. I glanced over it. I saw the name, and I went on, and I kind of blocked it out for as long as I could, because you know it can't be very good. They were not orthodox, but someone must have told them about this. I've written about it elsewhere, and you know this is why I think people like Michael Hoffman get angry. Um, so I redid a lot of my work in that regard. Because we're some of the at some of the more intense parts of Lent, talking about Antichrist, talking about the end times, and what I over the decades have put together, um, using patristic and philosophical sources among many others, as to what form Antichrist may take. It seems very odd to me that with the the snake like way that the forces of evil and the regime functions that they're actually going to put an actual literal individual up there with superhuman powers, and no one's going to notice that it's Antichrist. Now, we, you know, we could never bet on the intelligence of, of people, but that doctrine is so deep, almost in the popular culture, that I can't imagine they would be so crude. When I say they, I mean the regime, Jewish and otherwise, um, as to pull something like that. I think it's a little bit more nuanced. 
And I think the key element is in the Kabbalah, and that is the new man. You know, most revolutionaries from Britain on up have referred to the new man that the revolution is going to create. French Revolution did it especially, and the Soviets more than anyone else. And of course today, the last 50 years, the um, leftist revolution um, in the Western world, which we're in the middle of. If these aren't the end times, then the end times is false teaching. Because the ancients didn't have a, a way of expressing this kind of thing in the language that they had. So years ago, when I first put this together, things were bad, but nothing like it is ta- today. I mentioned that the court system was near collapse because there are so many cases. The court system designed in the early years of the American Republic is not designed for so many people, so many foreigners, and this kind of um, mass society capitalism. At any given time, there's something like 20 million cases in the court system. I went on and on. There are a thousand percent more sex crimes in the, the U.S. than anywhere else. A handful of people controlling half the globe's wealth. 44 million Americans reading at a fourth grade level. Um, the explosion of mental illness. Mental patients taking up about half the American health care budget. 90% of the population on some kind of drug, legal or illegal. Something like 60,000, usually white males, take their lives each year. Police budgets are getting slashed as the country is actually invaded. The budget is getting trimmed. Except the Justice Department, who back in 2018, 2019, so its budget increased by over 900% and more. Right, Really, I should say from 2003 to 2013, about a 1,000 percent. I said that there's been a 70 percent increase in teen prostitution since 2003. I think that was before OnlyFans, which I learned about fairly recently. And, of course, was not even a little bit surprised by it. Now, prostitution is universal and uh, institutionalized. The economy has long bottomed down, but given the nature of the media, most people won't even realize. realize. Um, most people don't give a damn about their jobs. Only a tiny percent of the uh, American population could serve in the military. Massive increases, usually about average 25% food, shelter, uh, medicine. Massive increases since the lockdown. Those basic prices have gone up 200% from the early 80s to the late 90s. 90% of the layoffs since 1978 have been uh, male, usually white males. And as of a few years ago, there were 21,500 armed criminal gangs in the U.S. as metropolitan police departments are slashed and are not allowed to do their job. And then the migrant invasion. I could go on. Everything that the average educated American, the normie American, believes about the world is a story, is a myth. The rise of materialism, nominalism, liberalism, secularism, industrialization leads to desacralization. No one even knows how to ask the right questions, let alone come up with the right answers. Sodom and Gomorrah were paragons of virtue by comparison to where we live. Now, I say that the fathers writing many centuries ago, um, didn't have the vocabulary, and they didn't, to talk about, you know, how could they, what would they think of OnlyFans, you know, that, um, but let me quote St. Nephon of Constantinople, 15th century. He said, and they will be rewarded for the fact that in those days, there'll be no one in their eyes who could perform miracles, and people from themselves will take the zeal and fear of God in their hearts, and for that time, Hierarchy's rank will not be understood and will not love wisdom or reason. They will only care about self-interest. Similar to that, monks will be from possession of large estates, from their vainglory, their soulful eyes are darkened, that they are disregarded and that love God with all their heart and the love of money will reign with all their might. Woe to the monks who love gold. They will not see the faith of God. 
The black hoarders, the greedy, their prayer will not be accepted. And fasting without benefit, offering the sacrifice to God, and all their alms, all are imputed to them in abomination and desecration. Now, that kind of talk is so common, it really falls on deaf ears. It was extremely radical to talk like that at the time, though. The lovers of gold. Well, people, I said this before I heard of the Great Reset, that in the last times, no one will own anything. But, of course, that's the ultimate goal. As far as monasticism is concerned, there are very few monks, let alone bad ones. Few understand what anything in, in religion or theology is. Monasticism is just cult-like to them. And happiness and money are equated, no matter how loudly people deny it. St. Anthony the Great said in the 350s, The time will come when the monks leave the desert. It will flow for them in rich cities, where instead of these desert caves and narrow cells, erect proud buildings, you can argue with the chambers of kings, instead of poverty, the love of gathering wealth, humility replaced by pride, many will be proud. Proud of knowledge, but naked, alien to good deeds. Corresponding to knowledge, love will grow cold. Instead of abstinence, gluttony. And many of them will care for luxurious dish, di uh, dishes, no less than the lady, from whom the monks will not differ in any way. The dress, in spite of living among the lady, they will call themselves secluded. I like this notion that the proud buildings that will argue with the chambers of kings, many of you know exactly what that means. That there will be a, a corporate sector, bankers, usurers, etc., that are equal and now exceeding the power of the state, royal or otherwise. Of course, he's also predicting the auto demolition of the church. Clergy today, such as they are, aren't really knowledgeable in anything, let alone medieval history, which is the font of the church in general. But they live in fear of being called racist on the internet. Now, St. Seraphim, uh, Veritsky, who I've quoted before, who died in 1949, he said, it will be so hard, so bad, so terrible that God forbid to live up to this time. Of course, he's talking about our time. There will come a time that will not be persecution, and the money and the lights of the world will turn people away from God, and many more souls will die than during open hostility. On the one hand, they'll erect crosses and gild the domes, and on the other, there will come a kingdom of lies and evil. The true church will always be persecuted. And it will be possible to be saved only by sorrows and illness. Persecution will be taken by the most sophisticated, unpredictable nature. It will be terrible to live up in these times. Now, he you know, died in 1949, but even then, he was far and away, you know, probably unable to understand, in the language of his day in Russia, um, the sort of life we're forced to live here. He already predicted the use of psychology, and of course it existed in the Soviet Union in, in rudimentary form, but psychology is the method of torture and control. He saw kind of dimly the use of the media to control, the very meanings of terms, the language, social life. So you did have some dim, very rudimentary understanding of what even, even we would have a, a, a tough time describing to anybody. The ancients couldn't really describe what we what we deal with. They didn't have the language to describe it. Now, as far as the end is concerned, you know, the Protestants have ruined a lot of that talk in the Western world because they've been screaming that the end is coming every year or so. They have no access to the Father. So they impose their highly limited interpretation of what they think the Bible is. An entire sect, some quite wealthy, have sprung up in these very human and, and limited conjectures about the end times. And orthodoxy tended not to speak of it very much until the 20th century. Now, it's difficult, and it will be difficult for me, to link the Kabbalah to symbolism, to the nature of Jewish control, the end times, of course, Adam Kadman himself, and the pagan tradition from which the arcana comes. The regime lives to a great extent by symbols. Less so than in the past, because there's no reason for them to hide at this point. You know, symbols like the rose breaking through the frozen earth, that is to say, those who resist the regime. The resurrection of the vertical doesn't necessarily mean that 
the resurrection of the vertical will lead to monarchy. We're the enemy. We're the frozen earth. In the arcana, quite often, the enemy is Saturn, which really is the rule of the, of the church, the rule of natural law. Um, you have things like sulfur, the principle of form, with a capital F, uh, fire associated with Osiris, the intellect, the sun, usually a very positive thing, connected to fire. But like gold, it could represent one of two things, either the new man that we're talking about here, or the rational person coming out of a natural community. The golden man represented by Horus. That's kind of what we're talking about here. In the occult, and then there's some, you know, legitimate metaphysics here, that the one is ineffable. That one gives birth the form, and in turn, form gives birth to the sun. That is to say, our, the sun of the universe. Now, the one ineffable creating form or logos, that's quite legitimate. But prior to Christianity, that's how the idea of the sun or actual solar, you know, uh, how it was understood. Reality becoming visible, unconcealed. That this ineffable one, what we consider God the Father, the um, the ancients considered the crown of divine chaos, largely because it was beyond conceptualization. The Egyptians saw it vaguely as the eye of the serpent, the not the ultimate cause of unity, because it's beyond such terms. But the one with the capital O was the very principle and foundation of it. The other thing I have to connect is something I got from Michael Hoffman that I really run with over the decades. The Egyptian god Set as one of the manifestations of Satan, uh, the destroyer. It was termed in ancient Egypt, you know, different times and places there. The man, as, as Wolfgang Heck's translation in 1967, he who was pleased with destruction. Set, that's not just in the satanic worldview, but there is reason to believe the dog star is serious. Set is a manifestation of the satanic principle, as was Prometheus. Set sometimes, depending on, you know, different periods in Egyptian history, was the creator in the sense of the demiurge, an early presence in the formation of the world. But then, a bit later, he became the principle of the desert, or of infertility. And then, the role of Dionysius, the principle of vice, the creator of confusion. It's the same as a chimera, the baphomet, the, the, the master of confusion, one who disturbs the order of creation, breaking the conceptual boundaries between, say, species or sexes or ideas. In other words, beyond good and evil. To know a little bit, I'm not, I don't claim any expertise in ancient Egyptian stuff. Symbolism, on the other hand, has been a concern for a long time. You do have legitimate metaphysical principles, like, for example, Ta, who brought about um, form by the word, you know, a, a form through words impressed since pre-existing matter. Atom is a bringing forth the idea of completion, the result of, of so-called divine manifestations. Toph and Tefna, the children of Ta and Atum, the, later, uh, the latter is order, Mat is justice and life, the manifestation of Tefnut. Some of these have, or just simply poetic, like most of the gods were, poetic understandings of much deeper principles. There is some, not much, but some connection between ancient Israel and ancient, uh, sorry, ancient uh, Egypt and ancient Greece. The idea of nature as the organized cosmos, the cosmos with a capital C as the ideal arrangement of things, the interplay of limit and the unlimited, which you see in Plato's Philebus, which really creates objects. Um, but Horus and Set are the same as Cosmos and Chaos. Two pillars, by the way, of the Kabbalah. Um, and the attempt to re reconcile those two. You know, the rose, like the rose in, in the, in the Rose Christian ideology, Set breaks through the frozen earth and constructs the world uh, according to himself. 
the principle of distortion. His name really means to separate, fragmentation. It's interesting that the Turin Papyrus has set called the evil day, a day where there is no giving birth or fruit on the trees. Something along the lines of sexuality not brought to fruition, things outside of their normal boundaries. And if we have time, we'll get into St. Gregory of Nyssa's understanding of this stuff in a little bit. And the fact that he's a foreigner, he's a foreign god, representing everything foreign, uh, is significant. Now, some may say that Set killed Apep, the manifestation of chaos, um, and the creation story, not, well, not really a creation story, the organization story, where Atum sits on the primordial mound, Surrounded by what the Kabbalah would call the Yen Sof. Uh, at the same time, Heka, the goddess of, of magic, Apep, is found in the waters. That is to say, the chaos preceding creation. Even before prime matter. Magic is the words of Atum spoken at creation itself. Form and chaos are meant here to exist together as equals. But killing of Apep, the, the manifestation of chaos, is not always given to set. That would go against his later development as a as a satanic principle. Um, sometimes it's Isis or Sekhmet doing this, or Mav, one of the many cat gods and goddesses of the of the pantheon, tearing him to to pieces. Of, of course, the temple of Set, the satanic uh, group, um, headquarter of the U.S. military, of course, under um, I don't even know if he's still alive. Aquino, his PhD in political science of all things. But Set is the demonic principle. In the Osiris myth, the foundational myth of all ancient Egypt, Set is a usurper. He murdered his own brother, Osiris, and his sister and wife, Isis, reassembled his corps, resurrected her dead brother, slash husband. Um... And it was a long enough reanimation so that Horus can be conceived. And so much of the conflict was between Horus and Set. And he was seen as a demonic uh, character. And he wasn't just the god of foreigners, he was a god of violent foreigners. Set killed Osiris, hacking his body to pieces. The Greeks would eventually associate Set with Trifon, and, and even a perverted understanding of Yahweh, a monstrous evil force, uh, raging, not, not cosmic force, but a force like a, an avalanche. Set and Trifon were both essentially ti um, titans, the deities representing Earth, like Gaia and Geb, who then went after the spiritual side of things. Osiris, Zeus, not too dissimilar to the, the Titans, which are of course, earthly rulers coming directly from Prometheus. Set is the satanic principle who the ancients understood had his seat at the dog star Sirius, the double. He is the father of Anubis. And he is, and this is extremely important, had connections with the Mesopotamian goddess Asarte, which is very important. We want to bring together his satanic connections. Also was the consort of Baal uh, from, from the Old Testament. But the connection to the goddess Asarte, one of the patron goddesses of Tyre, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, both dealt with that cult, the cult of the rich, the sea-bearing, usurious, trade-based economies, even that the flames of the human sacrifice are, in fact, Astarte. Tammuz, her consort, depicted as being surrounded by their dead children. Depending on who you read, she could be the sister of Baal, cunning, dangerous, a very much like Mercury, and Set is actually connected with Mercury. She's both the goddess of war and the goddess of, like Venus, the goddess of sexuality. She's the master of the horse and the chariot. 
She's also a prostitute, the goddess of fornication. Astarte used her beauty to control men. So she may be depicted in a military way. She, um, she was depicted even on the chariot being naked, which doesn't make any sense, but it was to um, put forth what she really was. In fact, the tree of life, that is the um, structure of the world from the Kabbalah, grows from her vagina. Now, fallen Israelites saw her as Yahweh's consort, as I already mentioned, allied with Set in Egypt. So any worship of her or anything like this would defile the land and it would have to be abandoned. The apocalypse, I've talked about this before, both in the books of Isaiah and Ezekiel, the, the Israelites there come to reject God, given their suffering. So magic takes over from natural law. Jews in captivity, that's the origin here, and eventually leading to the um, small group making its way to Turkish areas and, and the mass conversion of Khazaria. We have things like Gog, or the Invisible Empire, Egypt, and Set, the Crocodile, where the rich see the state as their private property. Adultery, the whore, profit, that is to say usury, are all one and the same. But Set or Seth was identified in one way or another with Baal as well as Astarte. And the sea, of course. Um, needless to say, Astarte uh, is the goddess of, of feminism. So all of these demonic presences in the ancient world are connected. Now, from that, we connect the structure of the world that the Jewish supremacists see in the Kabbalah, where Adam Cameron can be found, at least in, in one form. Now remember, there really is no God in any of these systems. There may be philosophic principles at the most, but Adam Cameron, at least at some level, deals with states of consciousness or how the world is perceived. The Tree of Life, and you see the uh, graphic that we use for this um, this episode, is a, a depiction of the Tree of Life coming out of the vagina of Astarte, are inhabited by the emanations, the emanations of the Ensof, which is not God, it is the flux, chaos that has yet to be made into anything. And it's the elite who force their will on it. The Jews, followers of the Kabbalah, collectively through revolution, bring themselves about as rulers and hence become God. These are the aspects of Adam. In fact, the, the sephiro or the emanations from the Ensof create the structure of the world, or the world that needs to be brought about. And the primal man, as well as the a uh, new man of the new age, the end times, is Adam Kadm. And it forms the intellectual edifice of, of Jewish control. Now, I want to briefly go through them. Normally there's ten. Um, sometimes in groups, like Keter's is, is, is the first one, for all power. It still has the chaos of the Ensof, which really isn't anything. The Ensof uh, is, in fact, simply the, the nothing. It, it contains potential. I don't even know how it contains potential for content, but it doesn't contain anything itself. Sometimes it's called the hidden light. It's not a form either. But somehow it has the the power drive to manifest itself. Remember, none of this is actually about God. These things are about um, wealthy Jews considering themselves as God. There's a world they want to bring into being. Keter is this initial will beyond conscious intellect. And the next three, Chalkma, Bina, and Dot, Dot has its own reality, are three levels of not the divine intellect, because there is no divine here, but the expression of this initial drive, the expression of this nothing that the flux is very much like a Nietzsche, the flux has meaning carved out of it. 
A dot represents Keter in its knowable way, knowable form, will and knowledge and dialectical relation. And everything else after that, these are both primary and secondary ways of aspects of um, a new view of the world. Reality, science, existence, existence, ethics, and action. Uh, they mix, you know, on the left side of the graphic, they're feminine. The feminine principle in Kabbalah is the receptive that nurtures and gives birth to what comes below. And the male, of course, um, on the right side. We're talking about Jews here. They talk about the soul. It's only the Jewish soul. And Kabbalah sees the Jewish soul mirroring this structure. Creation as reflecting the, the life source. They're the only divine people, so this is their spiritual life, understanding their own psychological processes. This is how they've come to understand the world. Scientific revolution was about remaking the entire universe. The relationship between elite Jewry and itself, its, its own idealized conception. That each level here is, is of the Sephira, is, there's a hidden force which is connected to an aspect of human experience. So the second is, is Chokma. The first presence of the conscious intellect. Keter is just empty power, expression of the end. So, Binnak gives it some shape, which is the third. The mother of form, the third move, the intuitive understanding. Um, some people called it, um, in, in some of the, the old books, a palace of mirrors, reflecting and multiplying from form to content. Multiplicity. It's the manifold content, as Kant would say, given shape at this level. It's feminine, so it's a womb that gives birth to the new world as the Jews have come to understand it and create it. We talked about this with Moses Hess a few weeks ago. We're already on a stage of deductive reasoning, one idea taken from another, with axioms that are already accepted as true. Bina is a rational process. It's something that the Jews work out to develop an idea fully. It is the scientific revolution. In other words, raw power is taken by the intellect and a world is created from it. This is the purpose of Kabbalah at this level. It's the recreation of the universe. The fourth is Cheset, the visible form. It's, it's mercy in, in the um, Masonic cult. See, the first three were epistemological, the world order Jews would like to create. Chesed is the first based on human action. It injects Jewish life into the world. It flows from the recreation of, of the universe. Justice, for the first time, shows up as their mechanism of control, their unlimited benevolence. Any reference to God is about them or is about Adam Cadman as the creation of all of this. The fifth is Gavura. Also having something to do with action. This is creative destruction, the ethics of the warrior. I think it is closely connected with the start day, as we mentioned. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another to make it real and force it on people. Then Tiferet, the balance, the sixth one. It's a force that integrates Everything else that we've talked about. Chesed is kindness, gavura, strength, and judgment. Those are the two pillars uh, that you see in every Masonic temple. One is expansive. One you know, gives power. The other receives it and nurtures it. One's male. The other's female. And, of course, reconciling them is to eliminate those differences. They have to be balanced. There's different ways of bringing out the same thing. Tiferet has the role of balancing conflicting forces, you know, severity and mercy. You know, Israel as a group of leftist hippies 
and Israel as a highly ranked um, military apparatus, high tech and everything else. And both have their role to play in remaking society. The other two that have to be balanced are Netzach and Hood. And by the way, if I'm mispronouncing these, I don't care. Um, I've only read them. The intellect balanced with emotion, male and female. You see this in a lot of Jewish entertainment. Nitzak actually is, is Astarte as well, the ideal woman. But Nitzak sits across from Hood, the third group, the what they call the tactical organization of life. These are instruments. It's used for something else. These are ways of an, importing the new view of the world onto the world, dethroning everything in the Middle Ages. So the first two groups deal with epistemological or ontological categories. That leads to ethics, and now these are how to implement them in reality. Keep in mind that all of these names and symbols and ideas, they sort of create a rational whole. They're very broad, but they're perfectly consistent with materialism. We're not talking about God here. We're talking about a revolutionary party in one form or another of how the Jews view the world. And it's and if it's not an accident. The first thing is raw power. The Netzach, um, this balancing act, chesed or mercy, sometimes has to be presented violently. This is designed to break down the borders, the the conceptual reality of the demiogos, or the he who's created the false world that they have to repair. Tikkun Olam is, is essential here. That's what revolution is supposed to do. Everything from industrialization to uh, you know, Bolshevism, capitalism, globalism, Darwinism. Of course, they weren't Jewish as such, but they served that basic revolutionary order. But Hod could also mean where we may take power. And Gavuda is vengeance. So a national socialist government could take over somewhere. Anything that doesn't allow the Jews go in full power is blasphemous, and therefore they're oppressed. And revenge is is Gavuda. Remember, these aren't you know chronological movements. These are different moments in understanding the world around you. You need a scientific understanding. You need a sociological understanding in order to do much, in order to have a goal of any social significance. Netzach also can refer to leadership, um, where Hod is the community, the, the, the groups that take action, make things happen. Netzach is on the right side. Hod is, is on the left. Hod would be the eighth in this list. It's a, the Hod is a force that breaks down energy into multiplicity. Different forms, different fields, different agendas. It is intellect, but Netzach is, is the power to overcome all barriers and associated with emotion and passion and, and violence. You need both sides here. You need both sides in balance in order for it to work. And the balance is to be found in Yesod, the foundation of the new world, where the different energies that have been considered so far await expression in the lowest world, the Malkuth of the kingdom, where truths, according to them, are made real. It's the skull where the mask has been torn off. Again, this is strictly from their point of view. Nothing they're really doing here is true or real. It's rationalization for their power and to dechristianize everything around us. The lowest is, I mean, the lowest in the sense of practicality is Malkuth or the kingdom or maybe the state or the world order. This is the world of phenomena and it has to be remade from everything we've mentioned already. It has to be remade or Antichrist cannot arrive. It's our world ruled over by the regime, bringing about the new man, or Adam Cadman. 
all of this about breaking down barriers. Breaking down the old forms and placing the total lack of form, the rejection of logos in their place, or power in its place. The old giving way to the new, that somehow this is in the nature of things, and it certainly is not. Just so it is the form in reality, not conceptually. It's a foundation upon which the regime can come into existence and rule without a problem. It's how the stuff we've already mentioned is transmitted into the daily grind that we're forced to deal with every day. To summarize this whole thing, we're talking about the remaking of the world, both psychologically and, and scientifically, so as to completely and totally desacralize it. Of course, it's not their creation, but they certainly will take advantage of it and use it for their own purposes, as Moses has said. Yesod channels all of this and actually creates institutions. And they associate it, of course, with sexuality. Yesod is masculine. It collects all of this ideology of the Sephiroth above and transmits it to the feminine world below. It's receptive for the ideology that's forced upon it, the politicization of sexuality and the sexualization of politics. And this is how this world is able to interact with the Jews as God. It collects and balances, yes, so it collects and balances the different opposing energies of severity and our judgment on the one hand, mercy on the other, and the Tefret above it, distributing it throughout the world in science, ethics, and politics, the system of control on a daily level. Malkut sometimes is referred to as God receiving flesh. The final stages of rule, the rule creation of Adam Cadman, associated with the realm of, of matter and earth, actually the day-to-day, -day, the world of production. Malkut is the ultimate receiver, and Keith, as we saw in the beginning, is the primary giver. It's one cycle, the march through the institutions, as the regime would say. Um, so... The Kabbalah, the story is that before creation ever existed, everything was light. And the first stage was when the Ensof contracted. People couldn't handle light as such. And he created a vacuum to give way for human beings to function, rational beings to function. He created a vacuum, space and time. And the ray of, of this divine light penetrated the vacuum and it became Adam Kadma. It was a projection. The ten concentric circles emanating from this ray. It's an anthropomorphic form, Adam Kadma. The realm of infinite divine light without actual vessels or manifestations. But it's also the fullness of all of those manifestations. In the Kabbalah, sometimes Adam Kadman is referred to as Adam and Leah, the higher man, or alien. Uh, sometimes he's called uh, Adam uh, Harushan, or the primary man, or the primal man, the essence of mankind, or jewelry, as it should be, before the light was broken in this vacuum. Of course, the job of the regime is to collect all of those light fragments from this initial breaking. And that, of course, is revolution. It deals with Jews and Jews only. Sometimes Adam Hakadmoni is referred to as the, the ancient one. It's both the ultimate divine purpose for creation, that is, mankind under the Antichrist as an embodiment of the Sephiroth I've mentioned above, or the manifestation of all these so-called divine attributes themselves. Adam Kadman turns out to be both Adam, man himself, and the insult. Kadman meaning primary, being first, but also the fulfillment. Adam Kadman came into existence before the four worlds in the Kabbalah. Emanation, creation, formation, and of course, action which is reflected in the Sephiroth we've, we've talked about here for the last 10 minutes. 
Each of the four worlds is represented by one letter of the um, four-lettered name of God, which we'll mention here in a second. Adam Cadman is represented by the first letter, Yod. Adam Cadman, most of the time, will correspond to the first emanation or keter, as we mentioned above. The divine will that motivated creation, but of course it doesn't end there. Now, the Zohar, as we continue to mention, is was something that was put together by Moshe um, Kudavero. We're not talking about Isaac Luria, the Lurianic, um, but in, in the Cordovero version, the Sephiro, Adam Cadman, the four worlds, they are chronological from the end self. It's a bit more traditional. But Luria, which I think became more, more dominant creation, it's a dynamic process, um, having to do with the so-called divine exile and the recapitulation of all things. The shattering of the of the Sephiro that created the present world at the point of creation. Adam Cadman is, in fact, preceded by the contraction. The light simply by itself was too much for any one entity to understand, and so they broke apart. The Zohar itself states, quote, the form of man is the image of everything that is above and below. Therefore, did the Holy Ancient select it for his own form? Don't assume that the Holy Ancient here means God. The heavenly man is the embodiment of all what they call divine manifestations. And the ten sephiro are the original image of man before the fall. The heavenly Adam, or the Jews in, the, in our times, the last times, um, are recreating Adam himself. So you have the original primal man and all of that being recapitulated at the end times. Then their Messiah can show up. Uh, Adam Cadman became far more important as time went on, especially with Isaac Luria. He wasn't just the manifestation of all of these forces that we talked about, but he was in fact a mediator, an active individual. The end self is, is completely incomprehensible. So even the manifestation of it in the Sephiroth have to be made more human through Adam Kahneman's uh, intervention. Adam Kahneman arose in the way of self-limitation by what, you know, and self, what most people will call God, and manifests himself in the Sephiroth that we talked about, this, this procedure, this method of, of understanding and then recreating the world, repairing it in the Tikkun Olam, sense, making it more understandable, Adam Cadman is the new man of revolutionary ideology. This seems metaphysical, but that's how it's presented. It's presented as a nature of things, when in fact this is all pretty practical. Adam Cadman is created in the vacuum of time and space, where God does not exist. He is the energy, however, of Jewish power, and he repairs the sephiro, the revelation of light. So man couldn't handle the light himself in his pure form. So God left. Whatever God they have simply doesn't matter, and they have taken his place as titans. Adam Kedman is a result of all of these shards of light being retaken and then reinterpreted by what we call the regime today. For them, it's the redemption of creation, the coming of the, um, it's the coming of the, uh, Messiah. The Demiurs, um, Yahweh, of course, who they reject. Christ, obviously, they reject. The old way of looking at things. Plato, Aristotle, all the way through to the medievals. These are errors. These are Saturn. The frozen earth, and we have to burst through it. And that's the role of the Jews, of course, using many other people as the centuries go on. In fact, the Egyptian Ptah is the symbol of this recreation. In fact, Adam Cadman, as a satanic presence, comes into being only when the Ensof actually leaves and creates this space, where man, of course, is the only thing that matters, in particular, the Jewish man. The Tetragrammaton, 
It, that doesn't mean I am. It means to be. It is the to be. The letters Yod, He, Vav, and, the, uh, and He, and back to Yod again. To be is something that doesn't exist, but has to be brought into existence. A global Zion. Yod is the hand or the arm. Osiris, the word, but not, of course, in, in the sense of logos. He, of course, is, is the real, the number five. It's a negation, almost in a dialectical way. Vav is very important because it's the six. It's the nail or the hook. Horus or revolution. Uh, another symbol would be the mace. Going back to the original letter, Yod, that's the restoration. So the first man, the primal man, and the purpose of man, symbolized by gold, of course. And it sometimes is called the pacification of the earth, which implies the military and sexual assault of the Astarte, deity that we mentioned in the beginning. Well, the four letters of God's name, I mentioned already, the four Sephiroth, uh, Chokma, Benetiferet, and Mountit, and the four levels of the soul, life, soul itself, emotion, intellect, and the true self. And many place Adam Kadman at the highest level of, of Keter, the divine will to create, which is inherent in Adam Kadman, is the center of what Keter is, or this raw power. It starts off with the raw power. The tree of life starts off with raw power, because this isn't necessarily about understanding something, it's about creating something. It's almost a uh, divine plan for everything is concealed in Adam Kadman, the concealed brain which you found in that first sephira of the, of the tree of life. So it's paradoxical. On the one hand, you have a created being, Adam, which of course they don't believe in, but, but they use it as a symbol. On the other hand, you have the manifestation of this primordial entity. Cadman, of course, means the primary. So he's often seen as the archetypal collective soul of the Jews in the, in, in the kingdom or the lowest level, the ultimate crown of all creation. Almost like the, as Isaac Gloria would say, this divine intermediate, which connects some kind of primordial infinity or, or, or the flux of the chaos with the finite created reality, created, of course, by them. And I know it's very difficult to, to get all of this stuff into an hour, but um, trying to connect all of this, you know, there's a book out, Jewish Utopia by Rabbi Michael Hicker, came out in 1922. I found it, I think I've mentioned this already, I found it in a used bookstore many years ago by accident. I didn't realize what I had found. It was a very, it was a, you know, scholarly uh, expression of what Jewish rule was going to be, what Jewish Utopia is going to be. And he follows very much my argument that the rabbis are creating a new world. They're not reflecting it. They're creating it or taking advantage of what's already been created. The Jews themselves are God and collectively are Adam Kadman. And because of that, they own anything that can be considered wealth. Nothing actually belongs to their enemies. That Zion. Israel is really profit and power. Wealth belongs to the Jews, as he says on page two. No dissent is permitted. Death itself, as he says on page 59, will be conquered through eugenics. The Noahide laws, especially that of idol worship, right? A God other than them will be wiped out, as he says on page 39, and even mentions the Trinity as something that will be forcibly removed from consideration. He says that on page 34. He uses a lot of Platonic language I don't want to get into. But this is a far more important book than a lot of people realize. 1922, before um, National Socialism and everything else, this was what the Jews had in store. You don't read this these subliterate you know, protocols. Michael Higger, of course, is far above that, that nonsense. Where he mentions these things, of course, in, you know, in pseudo-intellectual language. The state will be a universal one, Zion, and it will be rabbinic, both in a literal and a figurative sense. Any wealth that doesn't have an owner 
you know, lost treasure, whatever it will be, will be granted to the Jews. He says that on page 12. And any dissent will be wiped out, but he mentions on page 37, but, but given a fair trial. I mentioned Gregory of Nyssa and his conception of, of evil. But the end times are the, the reign of this Adam Cadman concept, the new man, which we see all around us. It's a temporary victory of, of evil. Evil really can't be victorious. Evil's defined by St. Gregory and, and the church for millennia. That which um, resists God, resists being. Evil is the unsown herb, without seed, without root. It's, it's a lack. It's not a thing in and of itself. It's a lack of something. It, it's, it's a removal of something from its purpose. Asarte is, for example, from reproduction or, or justice, which are, of course, a creation of the powerful for these people. And children, of course, get in the way, and so they are executed, as, as his iconography shows. So Gregory says, St. Gregory says, evil is defined as nothingness. It never exists by itself, but only inside or a part of goodness. Evil is a pure negation, a privation, or a mutilation. It's a dejectus, a defect, a lack. But the structure of evil, he says, is rather antinomic. Evil is a void of nothingness, but a void which exists, which swallows and devours things. Evil is powerless, and is powerlessness. It never creates, but its destructive energy is enormous. You notice that with the Kabbalah. Evil never ascends, it only descends. Evil is chaotic. It is a separation, a decomposition, constantly in progress a disorganization of the entire structure of being. But evil is also, without doubt, vigorously or uh, vigorously organized. Everything in the said domain is deception and illusion. Which is another way of saying, God did not create evil. Free will exists, though. And since you can't compel someone to like you, evil always remains a possibility, the misuse of things. And what I just quoted is, is the church's entire conception of what evil is. It's not a thing, but it does have an essence of a, of a sort, and then it's a void that destroys being. Being, essence, purpose, light, logos, energy, they're all one and the same concept, seen from different points of view. The activity of the true God on earth, not the sephiro, as we mentioned above, which is the imposition of ideology onto the world and calling themselves God. Evil is represented by the end times. Adam Cadman is a lack of reality. Demons use images, fantasies. They tempt people into sin with these images. They're not real. They're certainly taken from parts of reality and they're put together in a way in our own minds and we do this all the time. It's meant to invert its own purpose. This is why the media is so important for Antichrist and the false prophet. Evil, of course, is destructive. It doesn't create anything. It can't. Images are composite fantasies. They, they lead people to believe that some satisfaction exists in some perversion. And you've seen the sexual nature of the Kabbalah. That these gods and goddesses we talked about, they can't create anything. They can only rearrange, not just rearrange what's been created, but alter how we perceive what has been created. And, of course, it's also chaotic the real balance is very delicate but since creation is contingent it doesn't have to be the balance can be upset but importantly it's also the separation of the thing from its true essence meaning and purpose it's taking a good thing and using it incorrectly for the wrong reasons so for saint augustine it's just a matter of error you know we truly believe that sex and marriage will make us happy we find out that it's far more work than we expected, and so we suffer. Now, eventually, ideally, that suffering brings us to the knowledge that God and God alone is the only thing worth reaching for. Everything else, due to its contingency and its um, ability, its amenability to be, it's amenable to be fantasized about, it will eventually bring death and decay. So freedom, we desire a lesser good, and ontology, that nature is not a machine, it's contingent and it can be perverted in certain ways. 
again, evil is also illusion and deception. Images aren't real, but they often contain just enough reality to make us think they are. We fantasize about punching someone in the face, which I fantasize about every day, maybe of meeting someone more beautiful, of being wealthy, of being popular, whatever. We go out and we do whatever's necessary to, to make those real. And of course, none of it is real in the first place. The rich aren't happier than anyone else. They usually have more problems. Punching people might be temporarily satisfying, but it goes nowhere. Contrary to TV, you pursue a more beautiful woman only to find out that they're far worse and far more difficult to deal with than anyone else. Evil ultimately then is taking the image for reality. Appearance is mistaken for the essence of something. And it's a matter of will. We take the appearance of something for reality because we want to. We want this pleasure. We want, we, we strive for our, this fantasy image. And it leads to endless problems. And we'll soon die anyway, no matter how lucky we may have been. Knowing evil becomes, understanding this is very important, especially when these things come in the guise of the good. Saint Abba of Tbilisi. The end times is the war, as he calls, between red Jews and the church. Set will gather the nations at the Angog and Magog, the, the mountain of darkness. He says that the cosmos even broke away from Adam Cadman. Light is there, repair Isaac Luria. This is not unknown, uh, not that long ago. This is quite literally the nature of the beast. Hero monk Arseni Boka, who died in 1989, he saw this self, this this false prophet, the building of, of the new man, Adam Cadman, is based on self-promotion. He always knows better. That, that, that sort of mentality always knows better. Whether they know anything or not is irrelevant. The ends always justify the means of the moral disorder. Um, a total lack of attention, lack of any kind of concentration skills, that's the result. And I'll end by quoting St. Um, Arsene Aboka. He says this, I'm sorry that you're so weak in faith that you'll fall out out of fear, fear of the devil, and don't be afraid to save your souls. It'll be very difficult in these times. But by God, who is a companion to everyone from birth to death, the elect also will fall. I'm sorry that you're going to be one of the last ones. They will sift you. They will tax you. They will put laws on you. I'm sorry. He lived not that long ago. But he makes it clear that those of us living now, we will, there will at least be an attempt to make us fear. The fear of standing out, the fear of being different, the fear of being alone, the fear of having nothing, including your own freedom. Whatever the regime accuses anyone of doing, you can be certain that they're doing it. This stuff, Adam Cadman, the, the Kabbalah, this is a neurotic projection of a group of people who believe themselves to be God, but have rejected Logos, the second person of the Trinity. But who are those people who are not afraid? What are the marks, as the monk uh, Raphael Karelin, who I think is still alive, or if, if he died very recently? True love of God. You, you have this desire to pray for others. You thank God for suffering and problems because it makes you see things for what they are, not the fantasy. That the building of wealth is not a good thing. It, at best, it's a necessary evil. We're not self-righteous. We blame ourselves. We, we see ourselves as the worst of sinners. We seek solitude rather than the company of others. We don't seek justice right now because we know it doesn't exist in the world. And we know tikkun olam, the Jewish revolutionary drive to repair the world. To repair the world that Yahweh, who they despise, created. Because they are superior to him. 
and the magic of technology being just that. Insanity, as, as the monk Raphael would say, comes from passions. Again, it comes from the false understanding of what we're shown. Power and wealth, even if they're achieved, are illusions. And the self becomes split in two. We want the fantasy, but we're forced to deal with the cognitive dissonance that we know it's not what it is, even if we achieve it. People fear the regime because they think it's all powerful, which, by the way, a violation of the first commandment. Ultimately, pride comes down to rejecting God. As Komiokov would say, the Kushite mentality rules. Colossal buildings and colossal objects. Man is soon seen as a mechanical instrument of fate. That's the true foundation for the rule of Adam Cadman, the creation of this new man. That's what the tree of life in the, in the Kabbalistic mentality really is talking about, regardless of the abstract and pseudo-theological form it takes. Thank you, everyone, for listening today, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. 